Well, I guess we learn through repetition, and you'll see some of the sort of similar slides that uh, the previous speaker just went through with. Uh, so my charge today was to talk about periscopes and snorkels and fenestrations and uh, that sort of thing. I am struck as I sit here on the panel, the one thing that seems to come across from all the speakers is if you don't follow the IFU, you're in trouble. Basically, every time you try and push the device or do something, you know, outside that IFU, you're in trouble. And so uh, there's probably a reason that they give us those little inserts in the packages that we probably should pay attention to. So if that's the take-home message, that's the only thing you learn from this whole talk and this whole series, that's probably the thing you should take home. So these are my disclosures. So snorkels, periscopes, and fenestrations. Now the complexity of patients presenting with abdominal uric aneurysm has clearly increased. Um, frequently adequate proximal landing zones are inadequate or there's a risk of migration that doesn't allow for the use of conventional devices. And so there are a variety of device modifications that have been proposed and utilized to treat these more complex abdominal aortic aneurysms. So we'll start with a couple of cases that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, this was a 59-year-old male presented with a 6.4 centimeter aneurysm. He has a history of coronary disease, reduced EF, um, COPD and tobacco abuse, and it was found actually just um, incidentally on an assessment for back pain. CT suggested that there was inadequate neck for EVAR, and he underwent angiographic evaluation in IVUS, and this was fairly early on. Um, you can see that there's really a very short little neck between the, um, uh, that left renal artery um, and an inadequate neck for the conventional devices at the time that this uh, patient was presented. Um, here you see a fenestration. We were placing an atrium stent graft. This was a Cook device. Um, and then here's an example of a fenestrated graft post-intervention. Uh, and again, having been able to obtain a seal um, through, a more healthy, through a healthier segment of that aorta, and, and that was not, would not have been, been uh, uh, an option with the conventional uh, devices at the time that that patient was treated. Another one, this is a snorkel case. This was a 62-year-old female who presented with severe back pain and hypotension. This happened to be on Christmas Eve. These were ones you don't forget. Emergent CT demonstrated contained leaking abdominal aneurysm that was juxtarenal. She was urgently taken to our angio-OR where access was obtained both through the groins and the arms. And snorkels were placed actually in the renal arteries. And you can see this was the initial presentation. And you can see there are wires and stents in both renal arteries, and so this was a snorkel case that was done emergently in an attempt. There was really no other good op option. Um, I mean, she certainly could have been treated surgically, but this was the essence of time, and uh, um, it worked out uh, as a nice example of the snorkel technique. So endograft modifications and these adaptations. So the chimney technique has been described um, to increase the length of basically the proximal landing zone. Now, excellent short-term technical results may be challenged by the medium-term uh, outcomes. There have been some recent series, 13 of 41 patients who underwent a chimney EVAR suffered a major adverse event, including chimney stent thrombosis, type 1A endoleak, reintervention, 30-day in-hospital death, and a 25% decrease in estimated glomerular filtration rate after discharge. So the Kaplan-Meier estimated probability of freedom from major adverse er events at three years was 57.9%. Now, fenestrated devices, and again, I'm old enough to have remembered when we were doing these on the back table, trying to make these, um, uh, we did not have all of the fancy <laughs> centerline management uh, or center, centerline CT evaluation that we have now. Um, uh, frequently, you'd make a fenestration, it would be in the wrong place. You'd have to try and twist the graft around. Uh, it was, they were often very long cases, and clearly, we're not ready for prime time. Mastrashi and colleagues from the Cleveland Clinic reported um, on 650 patients who underwent branched and or fenestrated endografts to assess the durability of these, um, the, of these different types of devices. Over an average of three years, follow-up deaths were attributable to the branches or fenestrations were uncommon. Reinterventions related to branch complications occurred in just under 16% of patients. And the authors concluded that complex repairs using branched and fenestrated endografts appear to be durable, however vigilant follow-up needs to be insured. Now, fenestrated uh, graphs, a recent propensity analysis compared the outcomes between fenestrated and endovascular aneurysm repair and open. Uh, FEVAR was associated with a 5.1-fold increased risk of 30-day mortality, a 2.3-fold increased risk for any complication, 
and a 24-fold increased risk for graft complications. So fenestrated EVAR complications include SMA stent migration, renal artery thrombosis, iliac limb thrombosis, acute ischemic uh, events from iliac dissection, and mesenteric infarction was actually one of the principal causes of death in a, in a small group of these patients. Again, you saw a similar slide before. This was uh, um, Gore's uh, first attempt now. This is a commercially available device now, um, the iliac branch device, to try and maintain flow in the internal iliac artery. This has always been a problem in many of these patients who have uh, both abdominal aortic and iliac aneurysms, and often um, trying to preserve at least one hypogastric makes the difference between success and failure. This was actually an iliac aneurysm. This was prior to before that graft was available. Um, we used a different technique. This was where we sewed a, basically, a, basically a pant leg or made a culotte type out of a tube graft. You can see us, uh, my fellow here, sewing this using Hager dilators, tied it, reinserted the device, and then placed it up across. And you can see the wire going into the hypogastric. And there's the final result. So this was actually predated, and this was obviously, these were long cases, lots of radiation. Um, now with a commercially available device, this is actually um, uh, certainly improved. The development of branch endografts is ongoing, and there are multiple companies involved. And of course, I salivate when I go to the meetings and see these patients, these companies, and they show me their various branch devices. Um, clearly, there are theoretical advantages. Um, there's less chance for leak at the site of fenestration. It tends to be a more secure placement. There are some disadvantages, including application to diverse anatomies, and I think that's really one of the major limiting factors that the companies are wrestling with, um, and essentially a need for customization for these patients due to the diverse anatomical features of patients with uh, both aortic and iliac aneurysms. And the application to date, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, really has been limited to very highly specialized centers. Branched applications, again, um, there are th thoracic single side branch devices now being developed, and have been, some of these have been now used in man. Thoracal abdominal branch devices, which are modular off the shelf dev devices. And again, you saw some of the, from the previous speaker, you saw some of those same pictures. So this was just, I, I brought a few AVI files, just a few so you can, oh, let's see if we can get this to play. This was a snorkel case that we did pre. This was not a, we tried to do a fenestrated or get them approved for a fenestrated graft, and because of the angulation, we weren't able to do that. So there's the, and essentially what we did was added a, put a snorkel into that kidney and put a cuff up above that, crossing that snorkel, and we're able to get an adequate seal. Fenestrated device. You can see very short neck. You can see the calcified outline of that large uh, fusiform aneurysm and an inadequate neck. And then this is what it looked like after the fenestration. You can see we were able to move up that seal, and you can just see a slight endo leak um, um, on that left side that did ultimately resolve. So in summary, what I'd leave you with is that new technology will improve results and extend the applications, provide for greater safety and comfort for these patients. Fenestrated and branch endographs will continue to evolve and will be hopefully more adaptable to a variety of different anatomies. The delivery systems clearly need improvement. You have to simplify the placement. You have to reduce the radiation exposure, which is not insignificant for the operator and the patient. And training programs, they'll need to recognize the added skills in both imaging and endovascular catheter skills that will be required to successfully place these devices. And again, I suspect that it will be, uh, quite honestly, very specialized centers that, uh, that really develop the expertise in these areas. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. I have a, I have a question while we're waiting for anything from the audience. So with... Uh, ZFEN commercially available over the last few years and any of the other research devices that you may be involved in. Have you seen your use of, of snorkel devices or, or snorkel configurations go down or you reserve them for certain situations or how do you, how do you fit that into the algorithm? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, I think, at, very honestly, I was very cynical about the snorkel devices at first. I didn't think they could possibly work. I thought, I saw some early cases and I thought, well, they'll never work. 
and um, um, when Roy Greenberg was still alive and we had talked about it, you know, he, he said, well, he didn't understand how they worked, but they worked. And so there were clearly situations like that uh, uh, woman I showed you, the, the, who, where there really was, again, short of uh, doing an open operation in a suprarenal clamp, I mean, she was a candidate, and it worked out that we were able to fix her with snorkels. Um, and we've been surprised how well they do work for certain things. Now, we've been, um, we did snorkel a fair number of internal iliac arteries, and that's worked out really very well. And we've used the endrologic device because of its configuration and design that I think lends itself to that. Um, uh, quite frankly, I try and do a fenestrated graft whenever I can rather than a snorkel for the juxtarenal um, aneurysms if we can. Again, I think we get into trouble because we have patients with angulation, um, um, or in fact there is um, really an inadequate neck, um, and so there have been some of those patients where we've basically been desperate. And frequently there are patients with, I'm not at all reluctant to send a patient for an open operation. I think it's generally it's the comorbidities that have contributed to our reluctance to send patients because they either have ischemic heart disease um, or significant obstructive lung disease that um, makes them um, poor candidates for um, uh, open uh, aneurysmectomy.